Welcome to the Intercut Podcast, the weekly show going over the TV, movies, and entertainment that people can't cut away from. I am your co-host, Zachary Shevich, and joining me, he's not throwing away his shot, it's Arturo Zurita. Uh, I'm going to go with the, I'm here giving you some mucho, mucho amor, finally caught that documentary (laughs) as well, Uh, but dude, we had like a drought of a bunch of stuff that wasn't coming out and then streaming said, oh. You don't think we could host some stuff? And we just had a weekend full of craziness from documentaries it's to too much comedy. To... Anything you wanted. No reason to leave your house. keep up. Yeah. It's J- July 10th was like the opening of the floodgates of like worthy entertainment. A lot, a lot yep. of really interesting stuff. And from a bunch of different places, too. I don't know why uh, some of these places can't really coordinate a little bit better. Like maybe yep. Greyhound should have been July 17th because there was like – Nothing on July 17th yeah. and so much. Uh, Greyhound, last the weekend. number one blockbuster of the summer as Apple Plus. <laughs> <laughs> we will get into that uh. in a little bit as well as talk about Peacock, the fall film festivals, and robot movie stars. But first, make sure you subscribe to the Intercut Podcast, the video podcast on youtube.com slash intercut pod or the audio podcast available on most podcatchers. Also, follow Intercut on social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We are at Intercut Pod. That's at Intercut P-O-D. That's short for podcast art. Let's start the show the way we start it every week here with what we are watching. What you been watching, buddy? Welcome to Chechnya. I've been waiting for the documentary since Sundance. Did you catch it at Sundance? No, I missed it. Oh, man, I wish you had seen it. Yo, this thing is crazy. Uh, it's on HBO Max now. HBO Now, HBO mm-hmm. Go, HBO whatever i think uh, it's it's all the way up on hbo too yeah so uh it's out there it is pretty much a documentary that covers uh, chechnya which is like on the southern part of russia and this country plays by its own rules and i was like oh okay that's very interesting <laughs> until you realize that they are insane there there mm-hmm. there is a the whole story follows um these lgbt uh, people who are running for their lives. They have like an underground railroad that they're like escaping from. Yeah. Uh, but the most interesting thing about it is the country pretty much is banning everyone who's gay to the point yeah, that they the, just pretend it doesn't exist. The The country is famously anti, anti LGBTQ plus people. And they deny it, which is weird. To the extent that the president, even when uh, asked about their gay population, says it doesn't exist. It's not in Chechnya. He, uh, he has enacted policies that has essentially erased these people from existence in this country. So uh, to be able to follow these activists, I'm sure, is riveting. The trailer for it looked yeah. riveting, uh, but y- you you liked the documentary. Yeah. Dude, I had no idea that man existed. Yeah, he sounded like Darren Wilson yeah. when he said it was like, you can't There's have a John Oliver your... episode where they talk about On this? Him. I might have to catch that. Uh, the documentary is interesting because in order to not jeopardize them, you know, uh, and put their faces mm-hmm. out there, it takes a little bit, and I was watching. I had, I had to search it up. I went to the press notes. They digitally altered their faces. So the guy that you see right in the poster, that is a digitally altered face because they didn't mm. want to do it where it was just them in the shadows. They didn't want to do it where they were blurring out their face. They wanted to keep the emotion. So they like they went out and talked to a, a PhD professor about the Uncanny Valley and what to do, and it pretty much plays off like a mask that they're wearing. And it took me 30 minutes to realize, wait, there's something off here. I thought you weren't going to show their faces. And then you notice it a little bit and you realize they deep faked them for the documentary. Yeah, I was going to ask. It's like those videos where they put Brad Pitt's face on like the characters from The Office. The Barack Obama one as well that went out there. And uh, the faces that they took were, I I, I can't say where they were from, but I am pretty sure they weren't from Chechnya. Uh, LGBT activists who offered up their faces and their voices for mm. the people who are uh, the, who they're covering in the in the in the documentary it leads up to something that i thought was an insane way of telling the story uh, that deals with the deep fake kind of being like a mask cuz mm. the whole point like you said that guy was talking about is like we don't i don't i don't know what you're talking about we don't have that here at all and they're showing you little by little all of these intercepted clips that they get of like all the craziness that's happening over there they that for honestly here in America, we take for granted uh, yeah. because over there, they're able to go by those laws and nobody wants to challenge them because one, you would have to expose your face. And then two, 
as they say, you need a body in order to even, uh, I forget how the phrase goes, but you need a body in order to say that there's a crime and they can't find mm-hmm. the people who are missing or the people who are tortured. Uh, very effective documentary, raw documentary. Uh, wow. It's on HBO. Blew me away, especially at the 80 minute mark when the, when they do a certain technique with uh, what they were using. Uh, highly recommend it. Heavy stuff, but pretty good. Wow. Uh, definitely going to have to catch up with that one. Uh, I know you also caught The Old Guard. I did catch The Old Guard. Uh, that was a part of that whole... I can't even think about how many came out that week. Uh, out of all the at, action at ones... At least six interesting ones. Six interesting ones. including and, Old Guard among them. And we'll definitely uh, get up to the ones we'll that I know you really We'll get to Greyhound really and yeah. Relic and Palm um, Springs and Bloody Nose Empty Pockets. Uh, definitely making an LME on Old Guard because I really like Gina Brythewood who did the uh, she directed the movie um, 20 years that she's been in the business only five films mm-hmm. that she's uh, directed Loving so this basketball, one basketball Beyond oh, the Lights classic I love Beyond the Lights as well um, uh, this one's adapted from a graphic novel and there's now a sequel because of it the same guy who did the graphic novel also did the screenplay and it pretty much covers these immortals uh, mm-hmm. who have gone through generations and they've seen the cycles of life and every single one from Charlize Theron um, to Matthias Show and Arts has a different perspective. To Charlie's, immortality isn't fun; it's lonely. You've seen the most people die. To <laughs> Matthias, it's uh, it's a curse. So they all have like this different perspective of seeing it. Uh, it's a pretty interesting story. I like the chore- choreography in it. Um, in terms of Netflix movies, like Getting Extraction and a bunch of the other ones that they've had, it's really cool to see that they are getting good blockbusters. Like, really, right. really good blockbusters with great choreography that you can see from the comfort of your own home. Uh, the choreography is probably... Uh, it's not as strong as something like Extraction, but I did like the story elements that were there because I'm also reading the graphic novel and I like where they're expanding it because now mm-hmm. that there's a sequel, they're kind of showing you how different immortals that may be out there have different perspectives. Uh, yeah. One of the things that I'll end it with is there's a, there's a very interesting quote that the immortals don't keep memories because it's just going to happen again. Did you have a loved one? Give it 100 years. You'll fall in love with someone else. And the only reason that we keep memories is because we don't we, we hold on to them because we're mortals mm-hmm. and, you know, things die, things disappear. But for an immortal, they would think completely differently. And uh, I like the psychology of it, I, I think, more than anything else. Uh, so it's a, a good script and a pretty decent blockbuster to watch from the comfort of your own home. Yeah, you, you mentioned that uh, maybe the action choreography isn't up to uh, Extraction, another Netflix mm. movie, or maybe like an Atomic Blonde, the other Charlize Theron one. Uh, those, as we've mentioned, are oh, she's ones great. that were directed yeah, by former stunt choreographers. Yeah. So it makes sense that they have that uh, department covered. Uh, but you, you seem to be a little bit more into the story here. And like story. it does make me wonder, given that Netflix has done uh, Extraction and Six Underground and uh, all these other potential uh, franchises, if you feel like Old Guard has that franchise potential, if, you, if you'd if you be in for the Old Guard sequel. Uh, uh, yeah, because uh, again, the guy, Greg Ruckus, I want to say is his name, the stuff that he felt was weak in his novel, he fixed it up for the script over here. Then he got some ideas, which caused him to make the sequel graphic novel, which he then repitched to Netflix. So I think they're in, like, cahoots. I think the movie did well enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would like to see where they expand it because they do end the movie with a, there's going to be a sequel, and this is the person Mm -hmm. who they're going to be tackling and whatnot. And I I think this would be very interesting without spoiling it. Uh, I would recommend it. Cool. Uh, so among the other recent releases, you mentioned that you caught the documentary Mucho Mucho Amor. This oh. is one of the docs that played at Sundance earlier this year. Unfortunately, we missed it back then. Uh, now it's available mm-hmm. on Netflix. I'm talking about the life of Walter Mercado, this sort of ethereal, uh, uh, hard to even describe presence in that he he bl- plays with g- uh, gender and uh, his, his look is so uh, ambiguous, yet he's got this... Uh, charismatic showmanship in the the way that he does these astrology readings. He uh, is somebody who was watched by millions and millions of people. Uh, Unknown to me, I will say, Mm. before this documentary. Did you know about Walter Mercado? Zach. I, I, okay. (laughs) Bro, it was Cristina. It was Sábado Gigante. This is my grandma, bro. My grandma dresses like Walter Mercado. Always was on the TV. And to her, like, she she doesn't even believe in, I, I guess... If Walter said it, it was true. Uh, and that's what the, what the most interesting part about the documentary, you know, like, uh, did you catch it? Yes. Yeah, I caught it too. So it's like a perfect refresher, a perfect recap for someone who doesn't know. But the beauty of it was what they covered on how eccentric he was in a community mm-hmm. that doesn't 
really embrace that to this day, yet they embraced mm-hmm. Walter. That was fa- that and was a fascinating point. That's some of the most interesting uh, footage that they yep. show is the way that he would kind of be put into these situations with with people who didn't really know even how to talk to him, how to uh, how to deal with the types of uh, sexuality and gender performance that he was showcasing in that time and age. So he's such a interesting figure in that regard. Uh, and the documentary also has this interesting aspect to it because Walter. Uh, decided to basically abandon public life as he got older. Uh, to me, it reminded me a little bit of uh, what's happening with Richard Simmons. I don't know if you caught the podcast missing Richard Simmons Not from yet. a little while ago, but Richard Simmons being, uh, you know, this very uh, effeminate but eccentric character that was big uh, in, in I think, the 70s and 80s here, who then also disappeared from public life as he got older. Uh, some of the parallels, I thought, were, were very interesting. So if you're looking maybe for further uh, stuff to d- dive okay. into after you watch Mucho Mucho Amor, I'd check out Missing Richard Simmons, the podcast. Um, but, yeah, I thought this was a very interesting documentary for a lot of reasons. Uh, Did you ever catch Sister Amy? Which one? Sister Amy. I know that played at Sundance a while back. No, yeah. Uh, you caught that one. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know her full name, but Sister Amy is, is based off of uh, a, pr- a preacher in the, I think, like 1910s, 1920s. That reminded me a lot of that, how she was also playing with those gender norms uh, and also mm-hmm. ha- had an answer to everything, just like Walter did. Anything that you threw her way also had an answer to. Uh, that's what uh, the way that the, the documentary covered uh, Walter, that's what it reminded me a lot of. I was like, dang. Every, like like you said, that was in the 70s and 80s for Richard, and I don't really know him. There's always those eccentric figures that are out there, and they embrace an entire part of the public. Um, so I'm, I'm glad. I know and, a lot of Sister Amy documentaries are also being made as well. Yeah, and, and the way that Walter was kind of this figure uh, that younger people could look up to and maybe Still see today, a little bit of that's crazy. In. He hasn't even had it, anything, it, and they, they love him. So yeah, that's dope. Yeah, it's uh, pretty awesome to see. Uh did you catch Relic again? I know you caught this one back when it was at Sundance. Uh, I ended up watching Palm Springs again, uh, so I haven't caught Relic, but Relic is actually the one I'm most excited to rewatch. I was able to catch a couple more interviews with it and seeing everyone who's been breaking it down. Uh, did you mm-hmm. catch it twice? Or yeah, first? So, no, this is my first time. I didn't get to see it at what Sundance. Think? So uh, We had a big debate yeah, about this at Sundance. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting movie. It's kind of gotten the label of like this year's hereditary in that it's the horror movie that emerges from Sundance and it's got that uh, very A24 esque like slow horror quality where there's a real sense of foreboding and a, and a, a looming haunting happening mm-hmm. but there's not necessarily a lot of scary stuff in the first even like two thirds of the movie you know there's a couple small jump scares whether it's the uh, opening of like the trash bin lid or a, a very noisy laundry machine in which I think that the director uh, Natalie Erica James shows that she's a very uh, very smart director of these kind of horror set pieces I think uh, it's extremely well well directed and, and the look and feel of the movie is really good. Uh, I think had I seen it in the mountains of Utah, I would have maybe lost a little bit of patience with it. But I ultimately uh, liked uh, where it ended up in, in this sort of idea of uh, what's inherited uh, yep. through family and like uh, the idea of caring for a loved one as they deteriorate. Yep. Sort of the, the messages of the movie – I, I thought were really well done in that way that horror can kind of, uh, you know, mess with their expectations, but ultimately give you this heartwarming thing at the center. Yeah, that's been one of the biggest thing with this movie, Sea Fever, which is another one that came out. Uh, that one was from mm-hmm. Tiff. They've all been like marketed as horror movies. And there, there is, there's that aspect of horror, but with Sea Fever, she's like, I feel like everybody thinks that they're going to watch the thing or abyss and it's not, it's an eco thriller. Right. This one, like you said, I, I feel like a lot of people go in there. It's wanting family to, melodrama. It's a family melodrama. You got the grandma and then you got the mom and then you have the daughter. And it's like you said, that entire thing of uh, when you get to the last 20 minutes, I think it's superb. I love, yeah. love the final show. Agree. As you said, everything else before it, uh, and especially in the theater that I saw it in, the mixing wasn't fully there and I could just, mm-hmm. I could just tell. Um, and they really like the, with the production design and a lot of the, the, like you said, it's not so much jump scares as it is like the environment and the tension that's building up. 
Um, so I really want to rewatch it again uh, with the full surround sound and really dig and notice like a couple of the things because I know she took a lot of inspiration from a lot of Asian horror, um, mm-hmm. especially with the uh, the physicality of it. And from what I know, a lot most of it is practical effects. They have a little behind the scenes and they have her coming out of some of the stuff that you see in the latter half of the movie. But <laughs> I would highly recommend it. Maybe you need some patience at the beginning, but I absolutely adore the last 20 minutes. Uh, it yeah. it hits that theme straight home. And it continues the streak of, like, really interesting Australian horror films. Yeah. Uh, Babadook still being the king of them, I believe. But something's happening down there. We're going to have to talk to <laughs> about it. Uh, did you catch Greyhound also? No, is really the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I did in the background. Alina saw it. And she was like, yeah. Eh. And then I figured you were going to get yeah. it. I saw your tweet. So tell us about the – and I have a screenshot <laughs> – the number one blockbuster of the summer, according to Apple Plus. <laughs> How is uh, it? Right. The the new movie written by Tom Hanks, starring right. Tom Hanks, but directed by uh, Aaron Schneider. It, it's like a battleship movie in World War II. Yeah. Tom Hanks plays the ship captain uh, pursuing German U-boats and trying to protect uh, various bo- uh, various other vessels as they go along. Uh it's got this really understated quality to it that I liked in a lot of ways. The fir- the opening like 20 to 30 minutes of the movie, uh, there's very little exposition. There, It's all uh, them preparing to pursue this one boat. It's not like many other war movies where, uh, you know, you're shooting at like tens or dozens of boats enemies around you it's all focused on chasing down this one submarine and and getting into the minutia of like now they got to turn now they got to tell the guy at the back of the boat to do something Mm -hmm. i thought was an interesting approach to this uh the further the movie went along the more i got a little bit lost in the the mechanics of Mm -hmm. it without any kind of like subplot to keep you hooked there's not really much they tell you uh about most of the people on the boat. Uh, it's a pretty lean movie. It's only around 90 minutes, oh, really? which is rare for these t- kinds of war movies. It yeah. feels like maybe it's missing some stuff. But uh, as, as impressive as I think it was, and I talked a little on Letterboxd about how I feel like this would be better on the big screen. I don't know if yes. there's enough to necessarily have pulled me into the movie. Uh, so I, I was mixed on it. But I could see some people liking it. I recommended it to my dad. That's what it kind of seems like. You know, it yeah. feels like the like that war movie that I agree with you. Uh, I didn't watch it because I was busy reading and editing. I felt it though. The mixing in the movie <laughs> is great. The the yeah. mixing was fantastic. I would hear like the planes passing. I was like, "What do you?" Is Greyhound? It was Greyhound on the on mm-hmm. the TV. So I, I'm sure because it was. It was supposed to be in theaters before Apple picked it up for the 75 mil. Um, but story wise, is when I realized I was like, I, I guess I don't have to immediately sit down. I'll continue working on what I was working on. But yeah. I mean, it's it's fairly straightforward, but I just I ultimately don't care as much about the mechanics of battle as I think this movie did. So mm-hmm. that might be something that interests some people. I, I was less into it. Um, do you want to talk at all about First Cow, or are we going to save that? The fact you're mentioning it, and the fact that I'm saying we're going to save it, watch First Cow <laughs> is the best thing that I can right. say at the what we've been watching. But yeah, we want to work on a, a let us explain on that. Uh, you liked it, right? Well, I know oh, you yeah. liked it. You uh, recommended I mean, it to me. What am I talking about? <laughs> I had it on my, my best movies of the year before I even got to rewatch uh, it. Yeah, because so. you got to see it in New York. You got to see it in a, um, what are they called? Um, theaters? Movie theater. The, movie theater, yeah. yeah. Uh, right, I got to catch right. it at home. It's still just as great. I'm going to save it. I'm going to save it. But long yours. Yeah. I finally realized what the word was. Long yours. They had some okay ones. I'm still not a fan of long yours. But I like the way that she did them in this movie. Uh, I caught a couple of TV shows that I wanted to okay. talk about. I, I finally saw uh, the full third season of Search Party. It's the show that started on TBS, but now yeah. has moved to HBO Max with Alia Shawkat, uh, John Reynolds, John Early, uh, Margaret Hagner, Meredith Hagner. I'm forgetting her name. Uh, but it's got a really fun cast of, of young actors. It also brings in a lot of people from the New York alt comedy scene, whether that's like Cola Scola or Kat Cohen. Uh, so there's a lot of very funny people on this show. It's got this kind of uh, millennial culture meets murder mystery vibe mm-hmm. that has been going on for a couple of seasons. And uh, w- without necessarily spoiling too much, this one is maybe a little more focused on like the culture of murder trials and, and the media focus on uh, people who are in that type of spotlight. Uh, and there's this thing going on where 
they are the characters are faced with their own selfishness in the face of mortal consequences and they the way in which it's written how they deny their own reality in order to sort of perpetuate their own self image, I think is so smartly written and so devastatingly funny, cringeworthy at times. Uh, I think it's just one of the more brilliantly uh, conceived shows on TV right now, even though uh, HBO max, but regardless, uh, Alia Shawkat's great. She's maybe my favorite comedic mm-hmm. performance of the year. Uh, it's got also a really awesome guest star turn from Salita Grant. I've, uh, I've been Tony, seeing it. Yeah, yeah. I think she either won a Tony or was a nominee. She's so funny in the the specific specific choices that she makes in this performance. Uh, you think it's going to grow old. It never does. She's so funny. Uh, so I highly, highly recommend the third season of Search Party. I, I know that you are behind on that show. I don't know. If, when uh, you recommend it to me, I got six episodes yeah. or like halfway through the first season. It was still on TBS. I was, I was, hey, I was going the legal route here. I could not do those ads. Now that it's mm-hmm. on HBO, uh, I know Alina's been watching season two now. Uh, does it end at three? I think they are signed on for one more season. Not bad. What's your favorite yeah, season? They got the like two seasons and a uh, huh, uh, favorite season. I mean, season two gets pretty dark. I really liked this year. This year, I think, made me laugh more than any of the other hey. seasons. That's dope. Yep. Uh, I'm also halfway through I'll Be Gone in the Dark, which is on HBO, the mm. uh, docu-series about the Golden State Killer and Michelle McNamara's pursuit of him. Uh, it's a really well-put-together show about a, a crazy series of true crimes. Uh, so if you're into those true crime docu-series, this is definitely a, one of the better ones out there in that it really gets into how they pursued this case, how they tied the pieces together, how uh, eventually DNA and forensic evidence became more relevant, but uh, just the way in which it gets you thinking about how to catch uh, someone who committed these crimes and also just in the way it lays out the the patterns and how uh, police can kind of connect yeah. these different uh, murderers through these patterns is really, really captivating. Uh, I like that show a lot. I also, on HBO, am loving I May Destroy You. Uh, I know you caught the first episode. I caught the first episode. There, uh, there are five or six uh-huh. now. Man, Every single one is such a rich text. I want to I want to sit down and have like a two hour discussion about every new episode that happens. Uh, You know, it's just a show that is so nuanced in its portrayal of uh, sexual assault and the different ramifications it has on different people uh, in the in the radius of it, uh, the different aspects of sexual assault and how it intervenes in life. But like to, to to describe it as a show about sexual assault also feels like a really minimal way to look I'm at it because it. it's so it, it's such a like fully realized world for for these characters and the way it's been hopping back and forth through time is is just it like brilliant in how it also fleshes out these worlds. I don't know, man. Uh, at some point, we're gonna sit and have a longer conversation about the show because it, it's certainly one of the best. I've seen all year would make my top uh, TV list if we redid it right now. You uh, did, yeah, you had it as an honorable mention. And one of the big things that mm-hmm. stood out to me, I sent it to you before you sent it to me, was that article that came out about um, Michaela Cole denying uh, Netflix the rights to the show for a million dollars up front. That's boss moves right there. She said, "No, nah, I'm going to gonna own it. the show. I am going to own the show. What do you what do you think this is?" And then found a better home at uh, HBO. Yeah. That's dope. Definitely a nominee for like business move of the year. She's also that. like I got maybe that. the performance of the year and some of the writing of the year. Uh, really, really recommend this show. Hope more people catch up with it. It's halfway through its 12 episode season mm-hmm. now. So you've got some time, although uh, it's ending soon in the BBC. Yeah. So I we're a little that. bit behind here. in uh, <laughs> got to get America. a VPN. <laughs> Uh, I have one more to sneak in here, actually, since we're talking about HBO yeah. and I did see this. Have you heard of Random Acts of Flyness? Ooh, I've been wanting to watch this show for a while, but never caught up with it. Also on HBO, right? Yeah, so I just got it recommended. I went in not knowing a thing about it. This thing, uh, let me make sure. I, let me see what the synopsis calls it, because it's pitched as a late night series. But it cuts to, like, sketches, mini doc clips. It'll cut to real footage. It'll just cut to, like, a, a just 
kind of like a reoccurring bit that that's cutting in throughout. Uh, it's by Terrence Nance. Yeah, I think he write, wrote it, directed it, stars in it, does everything in it. And it, to me, it's like it reaches your subconscious. You're watching it. And, you know, it's, it's funny. It, then it gets like really dark. It gets into a bunch of serious issues. But the entire time, it's the way that it's cut that I love the most. It's just the way that it's edited. Um, think of what YouTube thought they were going to do with their premium service that went mm -hmm. all out, right? And said, you mm -hmm. have an idea and you want to film on the phone on anything, go out and it's even injustice to bring up YouTube, even though we, we're on YouTube and I respect <laughs> YouTube. This, it's a really interesting show that I think is uh, just gone onto the radar for a lot of people, but it, it has some really big cameos in it as well. From uh, what's mm -hmm. his name from Mad Men is in it. He does a whole bit that, that was pretty funny. Uh, the main guy from Mad John Hamm. Uh, oh, cool. there's also like he's Stanfield's in it and I don't even know how many other ones there are. I've caught two and a half episodes yeah. and they're just, it, it's pretty good. I really like it. It seems super experimental. Again, it seems, and I, into I, I don't know how many like experimental TV shows I've seen, but that's like, the thing I, about I, it. And I love, yeah. and he's got a second season coming out too. I love that they are funding it and he gets into topics just everywhere. Like to everything. And, you know, one thing will be a sketch and then you cut to what is like a mini doc thing that is a little bit scripted. But then they bring somebody else mm -hmm. in and that's not scripted. And it's just that flow of it, you know, that you go into uh, a sketch to something that's real, to, you know, and it really emphasizes the entire point that he's making uh, from each one. And it's like a different perspective for each late night show that it's happening. I absolutely adore it. This new way of late night as opposed to the Jimmy Kimmel way of late night. Uh, but no, it's fantastic. Uh, and I, like I said, they're going to have a second season. So cool. I'm curious to know your thoughts on it. Catch up on I'm curious to know your thoughts on it. Of flyness. Yeah, I'm curious about that one. I don't know if you want to get into any of the stuff we've been reading. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You, you sent me the uh, why HBO Max Peacock are deadlocked in talks with Roku and Amazon that uh, Todd Spangler wrote in Variety. Uh, interesting to get a little bit of the behind the scenes of, you know, we, we talk often, I mean, I see it on Twitter and amongst ourselves, just like why certain services aren't available when it would seem like the logical option, yet there are these behind the scenes wranglings. Uh, and he talks about like one of the central sticking points here being that Warner Media, as part of the deal to get HBO Max on these services, wants HBO shows removed from like Amazon's Prime Video channel or the Roku channel. Uh, and that ultimately becomes this thing that stops millions of people from using the services. I don't know. What what did you think about uh, this article? It's cable services all over again trying mm -hmm. to make deals. And when you get to the minutia of what they used to do in cutting deals with, oh, you want this show or this block of programming? You need this many ads through here. And it's all this indication that they go through. The interesting part now with streaming is that it takes so many other stuff into account. Like you said. If you're on yeah. Roku or Amazon, or whatever else, I'm already paying for this. So why do I want it anywhere else? From an audience perspective, from a viewer perspective, mm -hmm. from the company's perspective, well, Roku has 140 million products out there. And every Airbnb that I stay in, it's a Roku. So at that it's, point, yeah. if you can't have the HBO app on there, how many people are not getting the HBO subscription because of that? I love that you brought up the services thing because that was my big thing when Apple TV pushed their first like wave of come get this they wanted you to just continue it wasn't just 599 they wanted you to continue getting all of these services through them mm -hmm. and it's something that i continue the, finding myself in oh god yeah one of the big pitches that apple tv plus had was that they wanted to be kind of this centralized location where like you can even search netflix stuff and amazon stuff but they want you to pay through them and that's mm -hmm. a thing that they try doing with a lot of stuff i've noticed that my google payments for youtube like for my youtube premium gets paid through apple and it's like that's where the article comes in and i start reading on how right. another thing that they're arguing isn't just viewers but it's how are they gonna cut the data they don't just want to cut syndication stuff like that now with streaming now with the internet there's another big important part mm -hmm. what did they click to get to here and that human pattern is what they're fighting for they want the data of your viewing habits and they are playing, not even rock, paper, scissors. They're just playing a tug of war game of you got to give this much, you got to give that. I think that's insane. I think it's something that we should be aware of as we literally transitioned out of all these cable services and how they used to always screw us over. And now we have all these streaming services. Peacock just got announced right mm -hmm. now as we're recording. They have their first originals. Um, and I, I, I don't know. They're fighting for our data. 
in order to watch the shows are just going to take more of our data. The streaming world's getting wild. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on it, but uh, yeah, it's... No, I mean, it's it's similar to what you're thinking. Uh, as we get more and more of these streaming services, I think the fight is ultimately going to be how many of these services can kind of combine elements so so that you can stay centralized on on a certain app or on a certain product because uh, they're all they're all about watch time and they're all about you know trying to keep everything under one uh one category or one platform so i don't know it, it'll be interesting to see how much of the push now that you know now that all these companies have pretty much launched their ser- streaming services how much they're going to be pushing towards including other services within their service and stuff like hey, that. And at some point, uh, you have to backtrack what you said, like Quibi, now available <laughs> on TVs everywhere. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, there was also the really interesting profile of Thandi Newton. Thandi Newton is finally ready to talk by E. Alex Jung for Vulture. Uh, Alex has done a lot of like really, really interesting interviews. He's probably my favorite celebrity profiler uh, working right now. So it's a good that, bet it was whenever great. you see him publish it something was great. Uh, to read it. What what was your reactions to, my, to the Thandi My Newton first piece? reaction is... Don't take my words. Go read it. Just go get the words from Dandy yeah. herself. That's the best way because the first thing that was trending on Twitter was Dandy Newton, whatever, uh, Tom Cruise. I was like, that wasn't exactly what she said. And y'all are running with the connotation that's a little bit different. Uh, mm-hmm. So definitely go just read what she has to say. That's wild. I love how she just came out and yeah. she said, oh, I have a book. <laughs> I'll release it when I'm gone. But let me give you a little bit of an appetizer <laughs> and just the crash stuff really... I think that was the one that uh, stood out to me the most. I don't know um, yeah. how deep in you got I mean, to there's the a, article, but go ahead. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, anecdotes that she, she drops throughout the piece that are, are really telling. Uh, I thought the Amy Pascal one where she talks about uh, not not seeming educated despite having a Cambridge degree is like perhaps the most damning and awful, uh, you know, kind of microaggression in there. But there's a, there's a lot of... Uh, really crazy stuff that she's experienced through her career. Uh, I think Thandie Newton isn't an actress we never necessarily think about as having had one of the more like interesting uh, careers until you like look at what mm-hmm. she's done, the the breadth of her work, and so she's she's a fascinating figure and and has a lot of really fascinating stories from her time in Hollywood. And like you said, people weren't paying attention to her; she was listening. She was noting. Yeah. She was jotting all this stuff down. Uh, yeah, no, Dandy Newton is fantastic. And I'd highly uh, recommend that, like you said. The different quotes from the directors who were working with her. Uh, I had recently, uh, on Criterion, they had uh, uh, Hollywood Shuffle, which is he's mm-hmm. joking about how back in the day, you know, you could only play a gangster, and it was sort of, sort of this way. And if you wanted to do it, the white casting director would tell you, you're not acting black enough. And she had quotes in there from her career where they were telling her, mm, you're not doing it the way it's supposed to be. It was like, the way it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, it is a fascinating read. I highly just, you know, it, and it's just a, a mini part of all of the other stories that she uh, she has to say. But, yeah, that crash yeah, bit yeah. was, <laughs> that crash bit was nasty. Nasty. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, a lot of stuff out there worth watching, worth reading. Let us know what you've been watching, what you've been reading. Uh, we'll leave links to the articles we mentioned down below. But we're going to move on to a yay or nay, breaking down the latest happenings in the entertainment industry. And let's start it off with the company that financed films such as To the Bone and Loving Vincent has a new $70 million sci-fi film in the works. And before attaching a director or any real actors to the project, they've cast Erica. An artificially intelligent robot to star in the film. The movie's called B, just the lowercase letter B. And the story follows a scientist who helps an artificially intelligent woman that he designed to escape their lab. Erica was created by Japanese scientists who claims they've taught her to act using the principles of method acting. So, Art, yay or nay, do you think Erica the robot is a good choice for the role of Erica the robot? It's interesting. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, we haven't seen this kind of blend of uh, technology and performance 
to to this extent on a seventy million dollar movie to give one of the principal roles. Like, it's definitely a development. It is a development. <laughs> They're writing scripts. They got AIs writing scripts as well. They put a bunch of the machine and the AI picks out the things that have worked the best out of some of the most award winning, uh, the the (laughs) biggest selling ones. And they're writing scripts like that. I'm sure many. I think they call it (laughs) awesome. Yeah. And I don't even know how many people, you know, if they ghost write, who knows? Maybe they robot write too. Yeah. Hey, what happened? What's her name again? The robot? Erica. What happens when Erica gets AI? Like her artificial intelligence goes through the roof. Is she gonna? Is she gonna like rebel? She's and gonna go rebel. Off script. Whenever they don't cast a robot, she's gonna get upset. Yeah. What? What if she demands like a trailer or something else? Um, <laughs> I don't know. What do you think, Zach? Are they taking? The, are they taking the actors' jobs? Are they taking the human actors' jobs? <laughs> uh, look, when I saw the headline, I thought it was very stupid. But if they're getting a robot to play a robot, it makes a little more sense. It to makes me. more sense. It's not right, like, like the um the AI that they're doing for uh. What's his name? James Dean, that they want to bring him back in a movie. Right. You know, that that's you know? something different to me. And that I'm a little bit more disturbed mm. by than getting a robot to literally play the character of yeah. a robot. I do think that like you, you lose the interesting choices that a human might make, but maybe that's my lack of knowledge about robotics. Uh, I, the way I'm looking at this film is the same way that I look at something like, like you remember the Tom Hardy movie lock where it's just like, it's just an experiment in like, how you can do a film differently. Yeah. Uh, that, where that movie, they just did the whole thing in a car. This is like, what if yeah. one of the actors is a robot? robot? You know, it's okay. It's kind of cool. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not hyped on it or anything. It's a lot of money for an experiment, but okay. Sure. <laughs> NBC Universal struck a new content licensing deal with Viacom CBS that will bring several Paramount movies and CBS shows to Peacock, the streaming network, for its upcoming launch. Paramount films like the Godfather trilogy, Catch Me If You Can, and the talented Mr. Ripley, as well as Viacom shows like Ray Donovan, The Affair, excuse me, and Charmed will be available through 2023 on Peacock. However, these titles will also be available to stream on Viacom CBS platforms. So, Art, a very important question. Yay or nay? Did you know that Peacock launched today? It's only because I had it right in front of me, and it was literally five minutes into recording this that I decided to interject. Did you know Peacock launched today? <laughs> no! Is it a soft launch i mean they they claim that it's going to be available to like 40 million or they have like 40 million users or something like that i it doesn't seem like it's supposed to be that soft of a launch although uh i heard it's available on xbox but not on playstation and they're also in, in that in roku, roku thing concept. exactly yeah so that was like one of the only other reasons but yeah i'm looking here they have a bunch of stuff from new seasons that were there one of the biggest ones and the reason like Al- alina's favorite show is psych they got the movie on there, you know, Psych 2. Nice. Uh, so I'll probably be watching that right after this. Yeah. Other than that, I mean, I don't have any other reason to go for Peacock Premium. Um, right. Yeah. I don't know. The, I, I was browsing it. Apple TV. I was browsing Apple TV Plus uh, over the weekend for looking for Greyhound and other stuff. And I scrolled through to just see how much stuff they had. Uh, they've got like 11 TV shows, like six movies. A handful of documentaries and a couple kids shows. Bro, they called me out it, when I said this seven <laughs> months ago. It hasn't changed. Right. It's an embarrassing lack Thank of you. content compared to like there every other major streaming <laughs> yes. service. Yeah. I feel like at least this this move by Peacock is smart to just beef up their library while they develop more original like shows. Like Max did and yeah. Yeah. More interesting to me is this idea we were just talking about uh, of whether or not some of these streaming apps will potentially open the door to a world where like a Netflix show can be licensed on Hulu or a Disney Plus show could be licensed by Peacock. Uh, Because eventually I think that's what will have to happen for some of these services to survive. When you start syndicating the shows and you're able to play them in different networks and stuff, I agree. That's so interesting to think that Netflix will now be the person, excuse me, also doing that. The one interesting thing about Peacock is that it's Universal. And, like, you just named Mm -hmm. incredible films. Universal has insane franchises. Insane Mm -hmm. franchises from Despicable Me, right, uh, to the Fast and Furious franchise. If any of Mm -hmm. those wanted to spawn off TV shows, they now have a place. That gets, you know, Jurassic World, Jurassic Park, everything. So any of those have series, you have 
from kids to grown adults wanting to get this. Not service. to mention, we've talked about The Office several times on this uh, podcast, how that used to be the, or maybe still is, like the most popular show on Netflix. Easily. They ripped They're that. They're getting that on Peacock. The other thing, too, uh, Universal tends to have a lot of other directors, and even themselves, as we saw between Universal and AMC earlier this year, they don't mind going VOD. Well, baby, yeah. they got their own streaming service now. So if there's gotta, any company, I mean, obviously it's not going to be like Netflix, <laughs> but if there's any company that can now choose to go and ignore the theatrical route, they now have their own service, you know? Yep. Scoops came yep. out on uh, HBO Max, what, three right. months, not even, after it was uh, released on VOD, and now you'll have a place to, to uh, have all of your movies. So, yeah, Maybe we'll be getting, uh, what is it, Candyman I think, on, on here. Ooh, <laughs> maybe I do need premium. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the recent release of Palm Springs on Hulu, as well as Greyhound on Apple TV Plus, helped both streaming services claim their biggest hits yet. Yep. IndieWire reported that Palm Springs was watched for more hours over its opening three days than any other Hulu movie release, while Deadline wrote that Greyhound was viewed more on its opening weekend than any other Apple release before it. However, several critics, including Scott Tobias, took to Twitter to push back on those articles, noting that neither company was willing to release actual numbers to black up their claims. The Deadline article even notes that Apple TV Plus refused to acknowledge which movie Greyhound eclipsed in becoming their biggest release ever. So, Art, yeah or nay, do you trust these reports? Since 20... Zach, since... Zach, since 2017, <laughs> December 2017, when they released that movie... Uh, it may have been 2018, actually. Uh, the Santa Claus one with mm -hmm. what's his name? <laughs> uh, shoot. Was it um, Kurt Russell? Kurt Russell. See, like, and they claimed that that surpassed Jurassic World. I don't believe a damn thing they say, Zach. There is no <laughs> syndication at all. Like, you know, you have the Nielsen records for TV. There is nothing here. They're all lying out of their teeth. Like, I think, like, mm -hmm. the iTunes chart and Fandango are the only ones that actually give you real numbers and they give you sales. The right. Hulu one's interesting to do it by hours. Yeah, Reviews. yeah. I mean, you know, I, I might actually specifically believe these two reports about Palm Springs and about Greyhound because, A, what has Apple TV Plus had before Greyhound? That no, no right? Attention? Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. And, and B... There were a lot of people who were talking about Palm Springs. I saw a lot of people That's going good. to Twitter to talk about the movie and in a way that I don't think many Hulu releases before it had. Like maybe Parasite had that kind of buzz. But again, a movie in English probably is, is doing well. Yeah. Uh, the fact that they're releasing the amount of hours watched, even though they don't release the number, makes me feel like that's a specific enough metric yeah. that like maybe what they're saying is true. But Still it's not enough. It's impossible to put it into context. Yep. Like, did this do better than it would have in theaters? Like... How, how do we know uh, to because Apple even said that their release was like akin to a big opening weekend. Oh, where? Why should I believe that? What does that mean? <laughs> Not a damn thing. What does it that? mean? Nothing. It's like, you know, when the Cheerios tells you that it dropped like 50 percent cholesterol in people and then you actually search <laughs> up the study and they had them eating bacon for like three weeks. Of course, their <laughs> cholesterol is going to drop. I, again, you don't even know what was the previous one that they surpassed because it's just inflated numbers at points. Um, but yeah, I, I'm very curious what's going to have to happen in order to, uh, get appropriate numbers. Does it even matter mm -hmm. in the streaming world? It's all marketing. It's marketing. The, the most interesting argument that I've read is that a lot of actors and, and filmmakers are, are very, uh, they're reluctant about these, the lack of information regarding the numbers, because if you can't prove, well, I starred in this thing that had such and such success. That's true then you can't negotiate That's that you're true. a big star who's proven success. So maybe it's going to take like filmmakers demanding that some of these things get published. Uh, yeah. I don't know. That's how you maybe. cut your deals. I don't know point. if they have more, more power than the tech companies themselves. It's a great point. All right, let's do a couple quick hits before right. we move to our topic of the week. Dead to Me was revived for a third and final season. Art, yay or nay, you wanted more than three seasons of Dead to Me. Uh, nay, I like this. They're wrapping it up in three. Netflix got that good three seasons going, and they have an overall deal with her. So that's fantastic. More stories. 
HBO Max has greenlit a show from Matt Reeves and Boardwalk Empire creator Terrence Winter set in the world of Matt Reeves' upcoming The Batman movie, but revolving around the Gotham PD. Art, yay or nay, they should call the show ACAB, All Cops Are Batman. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure, why not? Make that whole next universe before DC decides to dismantle it and go with different universes again. You're excited about this show, though, right? I want to be. <laughs> Zach, that's all I can say. <laughs> I like Matt a lot Reeves. of people like are Matt saying, Reeves. like... Yeah, and a lot of people liked Gotham, so maybe this can be a darker, deeper version of Gotham. I don't know. Yeah, I like HBO. Amazon announced a Fallout TV series with Westworld showrunners Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy leading yeah, the project, right. Art, yay or nay. Amazon got the right people to adapt Bethesda's wildly popular video game series. I think so. I hope so. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Westworld deals a lot with this idea of like being in the simulation and uh, how the first season was kind of a lot like a video game. Yeah. At least they've got some experience in those those themes, those motifs. But Amazon's got Lord of the Rings and now they got this. These are these are franchises. This ain't the boys. This ain't hunters. Mm -hmm. This is things that's going to come. Amazon with the fan base. is really looking for that next Game of Thrones. We'll see. The recent news of a Chicken Run sequel being developed by Netflix has been followed by shakeups to the voice cast. First was news that Mel Gibson would not return to reprise the role of Rocky, but then actress Julia Sa Sawahal, uh, Sawala, I don't know how to pronounce that, uh, revealed she wouldn't be back in the role of Ginger, saying that Ardman Animation wanted a younger actress. Sawala, who is 30 at the time of the first movie, is 51 now. Art, yay or nay, Ardman has reason to recast the role of Ginger. They also recast Mel Gibson, so they are claiming, like, you know, it's like a, all of it is changing. I'm not a yeah. fan of it, considering that we had the younger versions of John Goodman and uh, Mike Wazowski, uh, Billy Crystal, do the young versions of them going to college. Like, it's mm -hmm. voice acting. I personally am not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of it. I don't know. I don't I don't see it. Right. They, here's the thing. They didn't even she claims they didn't even ask her to come in and do a, a, a right. an audio test. Yeah, and this isn't like, you know, Mad Max or something where the actors have aged and it's going to look very it's different. A voice. This is a voice a voice role. This is an animated movie. I mean, it's one thing if they're like, "Look, Mel Gibson's out. We're just going to shake the whole thing up and get rid of the character." But if they're keeping her character they're feels no. a little weird I, I know like scooby-doo changes the voices up a little bit but like people don't like that either <laughs> yeah but a, a lot of people associate both of the uh, psh, i didn't even realize how many mel gibson fans that were out there they were like bring mel gibson back so i don't know i don't know that one's for the better i'll say that <laughs> but we'll see <laughs> Lee Winnell is continuing his mm. path through the Dark Universe characters after boarding the Ryan Gosling-led Wolfman remake. Art, yay or nay, you like Winnell for this film. Yay. I, they couldn't find anybody else. I mean, I felt that I like, for Ryan really Gosling. Lee Winnell. I felt that for Ryan Gosling. True, true. I don't know. Uh, I think it maybe would have been better to have him be like the pro the producer, like the... Like the Joss Whedon, he, or, or who is, what's his name on Marvel? Uh, Kevin Feige, Feige yeah. Overlord. I yeah. feel you. I Okay, I think they give him this, and then he starts transitioning over to that. He just did so well with Invisible Women in various yeah. ways. So they're like, mm, we're not going to have, how much did they waste with their universe? So they're just trying right. to keep it, you know, to the uh, sure things. But I I, 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 hope, I think your, your way would be dope. I hope they at least give him a budget this time around. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, that's about it for yay or nay, but we've got one quick topic to hit in the interview where we answer questions posed by you, the Intercut viewers. So be an intercutie and send us your questions by leaving it in the comments on YouTube, hitting us up on social media at IntercutPod, or by emailing us, intercutpod at gmail.com. Uh, shout out to Jack Bolander for asking if we had any thoughts on the TIFF 2020 announcement when he asked this. Uh, TIFF had unveiled their plan to host a smaller version of the festival that included some outdoor screenings and online screenings. Since then, we've learned that TIFF, Telluride, the New York Film Festival, and the Venice Film Festival are all going to be collaborating in some manner, although they weren't yeah. super specific on that. Uh, Telluride, however, has canceled its planned screenings. So, Art, why don't you start? What do you think of the state of the fall film festivals? Um I personally don't think anything's going to change. Some people said April, then they said July. No, they said August. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's we're here now. Now they're saying October. I'm like, okay, I I don't see it. 
Um, I think it has been a massive dropping of the ball with not being able to come up with drive-in theaters or outdoor mm-hmm. screenings of some kind. They throw a lot of outdoor festivals, uh, y- you know, right at TIFF where they, right next to the light, uh, the bell box, light box uh, theater, they have a whole section mm-hmm. there where they screen movies. Obviously, it's not the ones that are in selection because there's a lot of people walking around, but it's not like it's not possible to have an outside venue. It's not like they can't collaborate with all of the sports that are not happening and you have arenas and other stuff. Obviously, there's a big case of money and the rights and stuff. And you mentioned that letter where they were not going to be competing for titles, but now they're not even playing. That's the most interesting thing that they uh, talked about in that letter is that normally these festivals are in intense competition with each other to to get the rights to the first premiere or who's going to show what and on what day. And and the fact that they're not competing is really interesting. It ultimately feels like they're going to because they're not competing. That might mean they're showing a lot fewer movies because Mm -hmm. they're kind of collaborating in that way and there's fewer slots to go around. But again, you know, it's not like we're going to be having you know, hundreds of screenings the way that these festivals normally do. Uh, It is also interesting to me because Toronto and Venice are in vastly different situations than we are in the United States right now. Uh, I don't know what the, I don't know what the case will be like in uh, the fall, but you know, it it seems kind of foolhardy to, to put too much into these kind of announcements without knowing what we don't really know what the future holds. Uh, Shifting in, Tenant gets delayed every two weeks. Every two you know? weeks. That that's the story in Tenant now. But yeah, we're not <laughs> even allowed. I, I know the uh, it was an extended even further the the closing of the border for you know anyone in the U.S. to enter Canada uh, to begin with. So I'm very curious how they're gonna mm-hmm. how they're gonna do it. Yeah, I'm hoping that the online uh, component will be something that not just us as critics, yeah, the, but uh, fans will be able to yeah. invest in too. I mean, the Chattanooga it, one we, you mentioned we, was dope. That sounds crazy. <laughs> Yeah, if Chattanooga can pull it off, I don't see why these major festivals uh, couldn't pull it off, especially if some of these titles are ultimately going to, like, go to Netflix anyway. Yeah. Like, why can't Netflix negotiate some kind of... Why can't know. we have Dune, uh, Dune released on VOD? <laughs> I, it'd be really nice if we were able to participate in this kind of communal event. As we've talked about, it'd be nice if it was kind of laying the groundwork for a future in which the film festivals are a little bit more accessible mm-hmm. uh, globally. But I, I don't know. Money. I, 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 yeah, it, ultimately, they they might not make those decisions. They might not be in their financial interest. That's why I, I get I'm, that. I'm keeping a a curious eye on it, but I, I'm not super invested in whatever they're announcing so yeah, far. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, we touched on it briefly. I forgot to bring this up earlier, but there was a really interesting uh, tweet that I had sent to you. Uh, Robbie Collins guy who fills in on the Kermode and Mayo YouTube channel every now and then a film critic from Britain talking about how uh, with the delay of tenant at one point, Hollywood is going to, try and release anything for the international markets because without Hollywood supplying the films, uh, all these international movie theaters, which are now reopening are going to be with, without several options and and it might collapse the global movie industry. I feel like they'd open the theaters here before they release over there because Mm -hmm. of piracy, you know, uh, because of just spoilers in general, you know, people are just going to want to find the spoilers and, and, and get them out there and stuff. But it is, it is true when you have the rest of the world that is opening and functioning, but America isn't to the point that they got the borders blocked on us. We build in a wall, but they don't want to let us out. Right. Do you release it overseas and not risk that market that is huge, especially for a movie like Tenet? When we look at the box office numbers mm-hmm. for how movies cross a billion, it, it's not even half coming from America. It's a good portion, mm-hmm. but they get 60, sometimes 70% because of the stuff that happens overseas. So do you mm-hmm. risk not opening it overseas and at least getting that money as opposed to like, how many times can you change the date on the posters? You know? Right. And I'm, I'm surprised. Uh, no, if, if maybe I've, it's been happening and I haven't been hearing about it, but uh, that more films aren't doing like a split VOD in America, theatrical elsewhere thing. I know we got a comment that King of Staten Island was about to open in theaters yeah. in Australia. Uh, I, I feel like that will ultimately be something that we see if this uh, situation continues into the fall and into the winter because at some point these companies have to make some money and as you mentioned they can make a lot of that money internationally so if 60% of the world's theaters are open and they can they can get some money back I still don't think it's going to uh, 
paved the way for the movies like Black Widow or Tenant that they really think are going to make like billions because mm-hmm. uh, they want the U.S. market to be able to pay for those yep. too. So I don't we'll know. See. It's it's a weird impasse. It is. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. All right, so let's get into the topic of the week. If it seemed like everyone you know was watching Hamilton on Disney Plus over the last two weekends, it chances are they were. Variety reported that the Disney app was downloaded over three quarter million times globally hey. in the first three days after Hamilton's release, Sheesh. including nearly half a million in the U.S. alone, according to the analytics firm Aptopia. It also meant a whole new wave of people who couldn't see the show before got the chance to see it. Yes. And while many of the reactions were glowing, a wave of criticism and dissent was growing. So, Art, let's take this one step at a time. Let's go. I know you've seen Hamilton, although it wasn't with the original cast. I haven't, for what it's worth. So what did you think of getting to watch it on Disney Plus? Look, I, I got to see it in Chicago where Wayne Brady was uh, Aaron Burr. <laughs> but I've also been able to see... Um, kind of sounds awesome. Yeah, he was, that's actually really great. He knew whose line it was the entire time. Uh, but I've also seen, let's say a cell phone production that just so happened to have passed me while I was in film school. Uh, And it's fascinating. I really do like the idea that more people uh, are now able to see it. It's way more accessible. Mm -hmm. Um, And from the play's perspective, it's not the same as, as watching it because of the cuts and stuff that happens. It is interesting. All of the little, like, I don't even want to call them nuances, but just the, uh, you're able to see the spit that's coming out. You're able to see a lot of the other emotions, but I don't really think it's a play where it's more of a lyrical play that's telling you what's happening more than anything else. Um, I'm waiting more so for the movie, you know? But Mm -hmm. it's still really interesting uh, the way that they captured it. Uh, And I'm more so happy that a lot more people who I know never got the chance to see it can finally experience it. And I think that's really dope. Yeah, I was thrilled just to be able to catch uh, the show, which, like, you know, despite the fact that I live close to New York and Broadway is right there, like, it's just so constantly it's so expensive too. hard to get tickets through it. It's so expensive as well. Uh, and also just the fact that the original cast wasn't a part of it, I think, uh, was something that was maybe That's a little it. bit of a deterrent for me. Yeah. Uh, and it's something that I think about a lot when I'm trying to catch a show on Broadway. It, you know, you like to be able to see it with the people who originated the role. And uh, I, I'm glad that it was documented in this way, particularly because it, it was this, uh, you know, breakthrough moments for so many of these talents. Uh, David Diggs, yeah. who's somebody who's become one of my favorite yeah. actors, absolutely, you know, became like co- went to a different stratosphere for this role. Um, so I'm really thankful that this exists. Uh, I agree with you that there's some aspects of the filmed production that maybe take away from it. I, I don't know mm. if it was uh, as dynamic as it would have been it's having not, to, being able to see it live. It's still worth it, seeing. And that's one of the things about musical theater. It, you know, it, so much of it is in the performance yes. of it and in the the noticing the little nuances of it and uh, witnessing the moments that you know are only occurring on that one day for yeah. that one performance. Uh and even just the way they filmed it, while it's cool that right, you can right, get right. a close up on Jonathan Groff's spittle, uh, I think sometimes you miss the the whole like production of it, the way that they are moving actors on yes. and off stage, and uh, the That's group the dance part. members. You just don't get the same appreciation for. It's one of the biggest things with a with a play. It's like you get to choose where your where your eyes are going with this entire production that's happening. Yeah. And here it's been limited to how the director wants you to see it. I know they filmed it uh, over two nights, and again, it's fantastic. That copy that I got off the phone, I'm not going to lie, it felt a little bit more dynamic, though. There was just something a little bit more mm-hmm. to that one, you know. Um, I, mean, I feel like that that might have been a little bit more true to the experience of being in a theater to see it, you know? Yeah, kind of. Uh, but no, it's, it's still dope that they got that uh, recording. And I know that there are a lot of other plays from the Book of Mormon and stuff that has the original cast that recorded. Uh, so I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. Uh, you know, give it, like, I, I hope so, and- because... Uh, yeah, Broadway has typically been a place that doesn't uh, yes. showcase their their filmed performances mm-hmm. because uh, once you do, it's it's thought that it's going to like take away money from people who would ordinarily buy a ticket. Mm-hmm. Cats, uh, I though. think there's a lot of ways that you could you think this is like promotion Cats. For, for something. I feel like this actually made me more interested in going to see Hamilton uh, yes. now that I had the experience of it. We've again, I'm going to say it again, Cats, they released that thing on VHS. <laughs> what did it hurt? Yeah. You know? Uh, and again, yeah, it's, yeah. it's like watching sports on TV. Then why are you going to the game? 
I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> it, it works the exact same way. I, people still would want to go see it live. Um, but then other stuff happened, right? Well, yeah, I mean, before we get into uh, some of the backlash, I wanted to talk to you about the uh, best movie of the year uh, talks that we're pe- people are, were talking about. Uh, do you think that a film's perform- film 2016 performance can qualify for one of the best movies of 2020? Would you be mad at me if I put it on my list of 10 best movies of the year so far? Well, now that you're saying that it's you, I'd probably be mad at you. No, no, (laughs) I I, I can't say that because I would go against like, no, I I can't personally say that. Yeah. But you know, (laughs) I don't know. I I would be willing to hear somebody's argument for it, but I, I feel like there's a difference between a movie and a film's performance of a play that was four years ago and. You know, I'm not going to yes. put the cast album on my best albums of 2020 because I only just heard it now. It's a good point. I'm not going to die on that hill, though. I don't mind if that was your thing. Right. That's what everybody talked about. And it's indicative of the year to me. Best. The end of the year list are indicative of what, of what your favorite stuff was that year. And Hamilton made a big enough splash for it. Um, mm-hmm. Sure. Why not? Did you see some of the Oscar bloggers trying to argue whether or not it would get co- right. nominated for any of right, So now you're asking a different question. No. <laughs> now you're asking a different <laughs> question. No. There is Grammy nominations yeah. for that about recordings and, and, and stuff, I believe, uh, for video. So I, it's not like it's mm-hmm. not, not going to win awards. But I'm curious if it yeah. counts as the Emmys because I think the Emmys may do that, not so much the Oscars. Interesting. Well, you since know? it was streaming. Golden Globes yeah, they, may even they, give it something. The Emmys have... The Emmys have categories for like filmed performances there you go. and stuff. So like the, this. it's so like the, it's already I, been answered. Yeah, I think it's it's just part of the disease to give everybody an Oscar. You know, like it was it's not enough for somebody to just get even nominated for an Oscar. People want to. It's like, oh, this thing is great and it needs to win. It needs to win like, an Oscar. No, it can just be great on its own and it could be its own thing. No, it doesn't Zach, have to be I saw Oscar a commercial thing. and I like the commercial a lot. It deserves an Oscar. <laughs> give it to them now. I mean, I, I don't care if some guy in the 1960s won and best actor for yeah. a stage performance. It's not the same thing. Uh, I mean, they got the rules not set the up for that. Thing. But in terms of a top 10 list, sure. It's your favorite of the year. It's your favorite of the year. Yeah. Uh, there was a wave of backlash that grew as more people got to uh, check it out. Yes, uh, some of the arguments were based on the quality of the show. I think a lot of people who are not necessarily musical theater fans also got to check it out and uh, it sort of complained about musical theater as a medium yeah, that, that uh, but there was also s- some more historical yeah. uh, objections to it and the idea of using uh, the, these people who were largely slaveholders and ignoring that part of their past I uh, wondered what you thought about those discussions around Hamilton what did you think Zach <laughs> uh, well I think that I think obviously for the musical theater thing, like it's just not a medium that clicks with everybody. Yeah. And uh, it's also something that I think just works much better mm-hmm. in person. So if you're already skeptical about that kind of thing, like but people were like calling it corny. Yeah. People not... were calling it corny. It's like, well, that's theater. Like would you yeah. think it's corny? I was like, obviously they're like, not there. They over that... explain themselves. That's kind of what that, they that's what it is. Like... And I got, I got that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I saw some criticisms of, of uh, Lynn Manuel's raps. Uh, that also uh, went around and like, you know, he, I don't think I would listen to his album like if it was just a straight music album. But part of it is it's the integration of it in story. And I think uh, while he might not be as complex of a lyricist as like a Kendrick or somebody yeah. like that, and even uh, what he's doing is imbuing hip hop yeah. into the style of musical theater, into into show tunes. So I think there's a difference between a Lin-Manuel uh, rap and like what you hear, see and hear on the charts. Yeah, but even then, this thing topped the charts. It got all the Grammys, and I think that's another aspect right. to hate on it. Which again, you don't have to like it. But some of the criticisms are like, "Oh, it's a boopity bop," and a ra-. like they all think it's Philip in the second half when he's rapping. But there is levels to it. Two big examples. One for one of the songs, and he does a great breakdown of this. Um, I think Rotten Tomatoes has the video where he takes the influences of Sugar Hill Gang and he begins rapping like that at the beginning of my shot and then gets into multi-syllable mm-hmm. it doesn't mean you have to like it but to say like oh he's just doing the hippity hop thing no he ends up getting into Rakim style <laughs> yeah. he ends up getting into a lot more heavier multi-syllable flows Buster Rhymes with the David Diggs parts as Lafayette then that's my second part the whole 
essence of David Diggs playing the two counterparts is that he's someone who, who even says it in the verses. How do you say it's a part of his role? And as he gets more assimilated in, he ends up ending the first half by rapping the fastest in the show. So it's like, mm -hmm. if you didn't notice that, I don't know if your criticism on the raps is there. If I feel like you maybe didn't listen to the whole thing. Uh, but for the most part, people who have seen the entire thing, uh, I think really do respect um, the storytelling that's yeah. in there. But then you get into the other stuff, which I do think is pretty right. valid. I do think it's very valid. Right. Like there's a difference between the occasional maybe corny line and like yeah. the, the greater structure yeah, now we're of talking the thing. The medium of it, but he literally does say lines like, uh, and I think the 10 dueling commandments are in one of the songs. He goes, oh, oh yeah, Jefferson, who picked the stuff that you have down in the South? And it's like, homie, you got, you got, you got slaves too. And to a degree, it's right. like the same pressure that you're putting on all of the films that were made by white filmmakers where, you know, mm -hmm say it's a George Washington biopic or whatever it is in order to highlight this person, you know, you don't really focus on the other stuff and they're grilling them like crazy. Lean Manuel kind of did the exact same thing. So at what point right. do you pick and choose who you want to argue about for it's certain this, reasons? It's this idea of like how much fiction do you want, like in your historical fiction, yeah. right? Like, you know, nobody, it obviously, Adolf Hitler wasn't shot, wasn't machine gunned in the face, but we accept that telling of it in Inglorious Bastards because yeah. Tarantino's trying to make a point. They interact and like I think here, I think here there is a similar thing happening in that Lin Manuel Miranda part, particularly through the uh, imbuing of this musical with hip hop and the the casting of all of these uh, traditionally white roles with non-white actors, I think there's a, a subversion happening that uh, gets very complicated if you bring in the, to the topic of slavery. And, like, obviously it, slavery is a topic that, you know, it's kind of awful to yada yada it. There's a couple a couple mentions of it throughout the way, but I don't know if the the tone of a show like Hamilton can support that kind of dialogue yeah. as well. Um, I did read an interesting uh, sort of article sort of rebuking uh, the premise of Hamilton, essentially, that talked about just not hearing from voices of slaves and uh, or, or, or people affected by that. Mm -hmm. And that that might be a way to to balance the show a little bit better. But I, I understand from the same aspect how that would would really complicate uh this kind of like joyous and rapturous show uh that it is for the most part it just becomes a, a whole other uh complicated aspect right, to exactly. it so i i get from a storytelling perspective why that might be tough i also get why from like a cognitive dissonance perspective like it might be weird to uh instill this reverence in these people who we know don't necessarily re deserve that kind of reverence but i think uh, ultimately, Hamilton isn't really like about Alexander Hamilton as it is uh, about like American spirit and and, and uh, resolve and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I think, like most storytellers in general, what Lin Manuel Miranda is doing is using the story of Alexander Hamilton to tell a story that he wants to tell, yeah. not necessarily the story of his life. So again, it comes back to that idea of like how far are you willing to stray from history in your historical fiction? And the same should apply with other people who get criticized for the same thing. If Lee Monroe can tell his, mm -hmm. I feel other people uh, as well. And obviously there's boundaries to it. Uh, he's embraced it. He's embraced it. He said 100%. Yeah. I am not diminishing that. He, my man was on, <laughs> my man had how many followers and decided to put himself on private. That was going to do it a damn thing. But right. he still embraced all the criticism. And he said, you are correct. There is a lot in there. And it's very interesting because, uh, you know, us who go to festivals or, or get preview screenings, we sometimes have seen something that gets embraced in a certain way and then the world changes. And in three, four mm -hmm. months, that movie gets released and none of that praise from the beginning was there or something that was di diminished and no one really cared about it. And I was like, oh, well, and during how many times have you heard during COVID times, this movie hits a little bit different, right? <laughs> This movie, I this it all get all over again for Palm Springs. This recording, really, they did it for Palm Springs too. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. Every review I've seen, it's like you know, during COVID yeah. times, uh, Oliver and Company just hits different. Look, <laughs> if the recording was released last year, 
Does it get this back? Oh it yeah, still gets backlash. I mean, it but would, does it get this backlash? It would still get backlash. There, there has been backlash since the play since premiered, the but it, it certainly is happening in a moment that is ripe for this type of criticism. And maybe we're better off for being able to have these dialogues. Uh, but ultimately, I think part of the problem is that they're critiquing a medium that doesn't necessarily hold up to this type of like truthful storytelling, mm -hmm. right? This would be different if this was an HBO miniseries on Alexander Hamilton or, or like the like the John Adams series, yeah. right? You know, uh, I, I don't know if uh, musical theater is really going to give you the kind of nuanced perspective that yeah. people who are criticizing the show are Agreed. looking for. May maybe the most nuanced that we can get is in the criticisms from it. True. Because I feel like I've learned a lot from the criticisms of it. Yeah, and like, and like I said... There is some stuff in there where you really just downplay it. <laughs> uh, so we ain't right for that. But, yeah, I think um, the conversations are now being had with the because of the Internet, you know? It's it's a completely mm -hmm. different world. And that, that would have been one of the other discussions uh, that we've had with, with stuff like Netflix. Being able to premiere Marriage Story, and now everybody gets to see it. And what happens with one of the scenes getting taken out of context, right? So now you have Hamilton. And you know for a damn fact not everybody saw it. But they're riding with the discourse of, you know what? I don't want to hate. I want to hate that or whatever it is. And it brings up mm -hmm. that thing, which I'm, I'm still not on the side of limiting and gatekeeping things. But uh, and there's a specific word for it. Uh, help me if, if you can. About opening something up to the masses. And whether that's better than keeping it... Uh, more limited per se. I think we've had these, again, we've had these discussions with Marriage Story where they didn't really um, see it as a positive thing for more people to see it because then it was just more people who were able to misinterpret it. I am not of that gatekeeping mentality. Right. As bad as the, the idea that like access gives people accessibility, uh, yeah. Who don't necessarily, I can't yeah. be on that side, even though, yes, it definitely does open for anyone's opinion to just come out, even if they haven't seen the thing. But, uh, that's just what you have to deal with with the internet. Everybody now has a yeah. voice. And that's technically how yeah. the show ends. Right. And also, you know, something that's been discussed often with Hamilton in, in particular is how inaccessible the show has been. We talked about how those tickets are damn expensive. And the, the fact that now all totally. it costs is like that that Disney Plus subscription is, is huge in giving people yes, who not just – can't afford it but aren't can't get to new york to, or or to whatever major city they can to see it uh the ability to see the show so that's one of the biggest reasons uh, why hamilton blew up was because he cast a bunch of you know people of color that never had the opportunity to even see themselves because all the plays were set up to be this way because geez, mm -hmm. how do you even get the passion if you don't have enough money to go see the plays to begin with um yeah <laughs> ironically it's still it is expensive to go see it but so it goes. It is really interesting to see how in, you know, four years, the subversion of casting uh, all these non-white actors in these roles and how, how much of a uh, how important that felt at the time, uh, how much different it feels in the light of 2020 mm -hmm. and all the new discussions we're having. I, I guess crazy. to kind of sum it to sum it all up, though, uh, how do you feel about Hamilton now? Are you still like. As, as in love with it as you were when you first saw it? Are you cooling a little bit but still like it? It's fire, bro. What are you talking about? It's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's you not know, perfect, I went it's great. Into, I, went, I went into it, like, really ready to kind of just roll my eyes at it and, and not uh, think it's as great as a lot of people are talking about. Like, I, I definitely approached this one cynically. It won me over, man. It's a, it's a really it good piece stage. of musical theater. It's got extremely charismatic performances. I've been obsessed with Jonathan Groff in this thing. Just his his posture and his accent. Mr. It's, Mindhunter. It, it's really good. It's really fun. Uh, when it's all over, man. <laughs> when it's all over, we'll go get tickets. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So uh, that's it for our topic of the week. We're going to head to the last bit of the show, the new to see, where we give you our picks for the week. Art, what should the people out there check out? All right. Uh, so like I said, I had mentioned uh, earlier with HBO having random acts of flyness. Definitely go check that out. Um, mm -hmm. But over on Netflix is Dark. You caught up with the third season? Masterpiece. Masterpiece. Still, I feel like I'm still catching up. Time's a construct, Zach. And I'm, I'm still within the world. <laughs> Absolutely love that one over on Netflix. So definitely check that one out. Um, and then Sea Fever over on Hulu. I really enjoyed that movie. Really, really enjoyed that movie. And the worst yeah. part about it was I went on IMDb and they were like giving it four stars, which was fine. But they were all like, I was promised this and this. And I was like, no, you weren't. 
Bro, you know these. <laughs> You know when they take a pull quote from a critic, a critic and they put it on and now it becomes technically the marketing of it? And yeah, the poster right. says the abyss meets the thing. And every interview she's going, but it's not a horror. That sucks. You know, they want to really market it. But what's worse than mismarketing a movie is people going in and then dismissing what it's really about. I definitely mm-hmm. want to talk to you about Sea Fever. I very much enjoyed it. Um, but again, don't go in thinking it's going to be this crazy thriller. Uh, look at it. More so, I know it's ironic that, I, that I'm bringing this up again, or just funny, hypocritical, baby. But in COVID time, Zach, it hits completely different. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about you? What you recommend? Uh, well, I recommend a couple things that I think we're going to get into bigger discussions okay. uh, on the podcast about uh, First Cow, yeah, which I yes. know you want to talk yeah. about at some point. But, you know, the new Kelly Record movie is uh, amazing, and the... Uh, the intimacy in her movies is always something that I think is stunning. Uh, the small observed human details, but it's, she's also unexpectedly kind of just tells you the whole story of America in this movie uh, about friendship. So we'll, we'll talk about it more. I'm sure, yeah. but it's one of the best of the year so far. Uh, Bloody nose, empty pockets, a uh, really cool movie. Uh, it takes place at a Las Vegas bar during its last 24 o- hours open, or does it? Or does uh, again, it? Again, we will talk more about that movie, but I think, again, it's just got these uh, really great observed details. The Ross Brothers have this observational documentary style uh, that captures moments uh, that, that are just so, so feel so real uh, and the way they are able to give you these characters of like a forgotten America who all turned to this bar. Yeah. I was blown away by this movie at Sundance. Got to see it again recently, blown away by it all over again, especially that last line. So uh, I know we want to talk about yeah. that movie more at some point too. Uh, and then lastly, Palm Springs, which mm-hmm. again, we, we got more stuff coming out about, but I, you know, I just think it's excellent. We, I love this movie back at Sundance, loved it even more now. I think I love it a bit more than you do, but uh, to me, this is the comedy of the year. It's, it's a great role for Andy Samberg and uh, Christine Milotti. I think I just love the dirtbag energy that it has towards the middle half when they're goofing around and kind of stuck in purgatory. Uh, I think it's extremely well paced. It doesn't waste time. It cuts right to jokes. Uh, It's, to me, maybe the best inversion of the time loop premise, at least since Edge of Tomorrow, maybe since Groundhog Day. Uh, Highly, highly recommend that one, and uh, we'll be talking about it more as well as the other ones on the channel. Uh, but I got a quick podcast corner. All right, what you got? Uh, have you heard of the show Running With Cops? No. Or Running From Cops. It's part of the Headlong series. So the first uh, Headlong series was Missing Richard Simmons, which I mentioned mm-hmm. earlier in relation to uh, Mucho Mucho Amor. But Running From Cops is a six-part series from Dan Taberski, uh, who investigates the show Cops, uh, which, as we know, was recently canceled, mm-hmm. finally. Uh, But it gets into that complicated relationship uh, between the police departments and media uh, and how the show Cops has affected how people police uh, and vice versa. Uh, It talks a bit about some of the awful things that have happened uh, behind the scenes of the show Cops in, in the ways in which the show was often sort of in cahoots with police departments and covering up some of these uh, misdeeds. It's a fascinating I podcast made all the more fascinating by recent work because this was, again, from the before time, so it the doesn't have that current time. context. But uh, I think it's worth a re-listen if you haven't uh, had a chance to listen to it yet. Running from Cops, part of the Headlong series, Great podcast. Definitely recommend that one. All right. But that's about all for this week's show. You can catch more from me, Zach Shevich, by following me on Twitter, Instagram, or Letterbox at ZShevich. That's Z-S-H-E. V is in Viacom, CBS, I-C-H. And check out my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash multiplex show. Art, where can people catch more from you? You can find me on LME Explain A to Z show and watching Peacock. Uh, premium price, no ads, 4K, all of that. <laughs> Just not on my Roku device. Or... Find me every week here on the Intrigo Podcast. 
You can listen to every episode of the Intercut Podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, or your favorite podcatcher. I like Overcast. And then make sure you subscribe not just to the audio podcast, but to the video feed as well. So you can catch our bright, smiling faces as we break down the latest in entertainment. Find new episodes of Intercut Podcast every Friday. Please leave us a comment, like the video, and consider heading over to iTunes to give us a five-star review. Shout out to our listeners in Nigeria and Israel for putting us on the TV and film podcast charts out there. Like our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages. All of them are at Intercut Pod to get updates throughout the week from Art, from me, from all the guests that we feature here on Intercut. Thanks again for tuning in. And until next time, yesterday, today, tomorrow, it's all the same. Is that the ending line? Is that that, is that the coronavirus <laughs> Palm Springs energy? Oh, okay. That, I was like, is that the ending line from Quarantine Palm Springs energy? <laughs> <laughs>